Okay, so welcome the Rust Proof team from the Portland State Capstone Project. Hello, everyone. I am uh, extremely excited to be here tonight. This is, uh, this is exciting. All right, all right, I'll stay over here. All right, so, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bradley Rasmussen. Some folks know me as Badger. Um, this is uh, Matthew Slocum and Michael Salter. Uh, we are part of the Rust Proof uh, Capstone team. Oh, yeah, come over here. Sit off. So, uh, we uh, ended up building a uh, verification condition generator in the Rust language. Um, and if you don't know what a verification condition generator is, don't worry, we barely know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, and also we will explain it shortly because it is, it's, it's pretty exciting. We're, we're, kind of, we're, we're, we're very proud of it. Um, so as you, if you don't know, we are from the Portland State University as part of the uh, Capstone uh, project. Um, if you would like to uh, sponsor a project, uh, there will be details at the end of the slides on how to uh, how to inspire a great idea with uh, with some with some college students that are all sorts of enthusiastic. Um, all right, so let me preface this: we are enthusiastic students, we are not experts. Um, so uh, I'm not I'm not, I am by no means an expert of uh, formal verification, and I apologize. Uh, but some of the some of the things in here are are really quite cool. Uh, the project we built is strictly a proof of concept, um, in most part because uh, everything that we built was built on unstable rust. Um, and actually, at the end of our capstone project, our, our, our we had to revert some of our code to a uh, outdated uh, version of the Nightlies uh, in order to get it to work. Um, it's still in that state currently, and uh, maybe someday one day we will uh, we will fix it and update it to something newer. But uh, yeah, uh, despite all of this, we believe that what we built has value. Um, like there, there's formal verification is pretty important. Um, more on that later. So uh, I'm going to talk to you guys today about uh, why why formal verification is cool and why I would like to see it used more often in industry. Um, and a little bit about the reasons why we don't currently. And I, su I, su I suppose many of us already know, but we'll see. Um, and then we're going to talk about the, the theory. And I do apologize. It's going to get it's going to get a little. There's there's a lot of theory, but we have to explain it in order to explain what we did. Um, and then we will finally talk about rust proof and the problems that we encountered when building it. So some of the problems with formal verification. It is very tedious and slow. Um, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a long, arduous process of, of learning, like, how, uh, how, how to write mathematical proofs. It's, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a long proce process. And, and formal verification is, it has benefits, sure. You can, you can, you can make promises about your code. Um, but it's really no, it's not a replacement for good testing. You, you'll never use uh, formal verification to outright just We'll never test again. We'll just do it all with, uh, with formal methods and we'll call it good. Uh, no, you need tests. Tests are great. Tests are fast and they, they, they cover enough to make sure that your code is good. But formal verification for those cases where you want to know for absolute certainty um, that it will always work the way that you intend it to. Um, so in the process of, uh, of building Rust Proof, we, uh, we, we, we kind of analyzed some of the, some of the things that uh, we encountered. Um, for example, um, uh, a while back I was enamored with this, uh, this project called SEL4, which is a, it's a microkernel written in C. It's about 7,500 lines of C code, and it's uh, in that respect, I suppose, very simple. But it's, it's a formally proven microkernel. And so the developers of SEL4, in order to verify that the code of the SEL4 microkernel was correct, had to write 200,000 lines of Isabel code to verify it. Um, as you can see, maybe that's a little problematic and can, uh, can really put a damper on uh, your, uh, your software engineering process. Um, many, many of us here might be familiar potentially with Haskell, um, at least briefly. Uh, we all know of it as that, uh, that, little, uh, that little language of, it's, it's got a little bit of ivory tower syndrome. It's, it's, it's complicated, it's hard to write in. If you can write it in Haskell, it works great. Um, but a lot of people don't use Haskell because it's hard to use. And it's hard to use in a way that Rust isn't quite as hard to use. Um, 
And then uh, there's tools, there, there's a lot of other, other tools out there, that, uh, for example, from a C, which is very close to, to, to the thing that we built, and it's a lot more complicated. It's a lot more fully featured, uh, per, perhaps obviously, us being a, a capstone project. Um, and it, uh, it, it's got all the bells and whistles, and it formally verifies your C code. Um, but I tried, I tried to figure out how to do from a C over the past six months, and I wasn't very successful. Um, so, as I mentioned before, formal verification is useful. Um, it can uh, give your code a degree of reliability that you can, you, can, you can point at it and say, we promise that our code has certain qualities. Um, we promise that uh, our code will, will never have an integer overflow, for example, um, in these particular cases. Um, yeah, uh, you, can make your code, you can make your code more secure. Um, you can, as, as I mentioned, start making promises about your code, and really, really the, uh, the, the key to getting formal ver verification used in the industry, I feel, is to automate it more and make it more accessible for everybody to use. And a formal verification condition generator allows us to automate that process and make it easier and make it something that people might actually want to use. Um, so at this point, I will uh, hand off uh, the, the discussion to uh, Mr. Matthew Slocum, um, who will discuss some of the, uh, the theory behind everything that we did. Yeah, so there's a lot of kind of theory that goes into making this all work, and you really need to understand it before you can see why what we did is a thing and how it works. Uh, so we're going to go over briefly uh, what whore logic is and what it's used for. It's just a construct that's used to reason about programs. And so you define some precondition P that's basically the state of your program going into execution. And then you have some set of statements S, and then a post condition that's true after those statements are executed. And we can see an example of that right here. We give the precondition that X is less than four, and then after we take that value of X and add one to it, we can say that it, that value is less than 10. And so it's, it's just purely a construct to reason about the correctness of programs. But we leveraged it to generate these weakest preconditions. And the weakest precondition, it's, uh, it's the most permissive precondition that you can come up with. And it's generated by applying the statements in reverse order to the post condition. And you generate a new weakest precondition. So let's look at an example of how that goes. So here we've got that same example that we're familiar with. But here working backwards, we, we, we want something new instead of P. We want the weakest precondition. And so we take Q, uh, which is uh, Y is less than 10, and then we substitute into it uh, whatever is the, the assignments that happen inside the, the statement blocks S. And so in here, we're going to substitute uh, X plus 1 for the value of Y. And now we have generated a weakest precondition. And we can look at this, and we can see that that could replace the precondition P. It would be more permissive, but no matter what happened, the post condition Q would still be fulfilled. So what do we do with that weakest precondition? It's good and all to have it, but we need to use it. So we construct this verification condition. That is, the precondition implies the weakest precondition. So we get this. Uh, this P implies WP construct. And we can use this to check for the validity of the precondition you supplied. So uh, in this, the one shown at the bottom right, right there, the P implies WP, we can see that when X is less than 4, that implies that X plus 1 is less than 10. And there's a little bit of some nuance that's lost here, because here X is it's bound. It's bound to less than 4. There's no value that would make this false, right? This is a tautology. Um, but if x wasn't bound, if x could hold any value, if, if x was 11, 11 plus 1 is not less than 10. And so we would have some discrepancy there. And so what we're doing with all this, we build up this, this verification condition. And then we hand it off to an external theorem prover. It's an SMT solver. And it looks to see if there's any way that it can make this thing invalid. Um, and if there is, it reports it back to us.
And oh, there's, there's one little caveat here, which is that when you actually pass it over to the SMT solver, it's looking to find one way in which it can make your formula valid. And so we actually pass over the negation of the formula. So it looks for one way it can make it invalid. And if it can't find those, then we've proven that what we have is a tautology. And now we get to finally talk about what we actually built. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Salter. Uh, so the software we built is called Rustproof, and it's a compiler plugin. Uh, and uh, we're going to go over some of the design, the design decisions we made, and then actually follow through the program, kind of step by step, and what it, how it works. Um, so we're a compiler plugin. Um, basically, I mean, we have to access user code. Uh, the S in the theory you were looking at before, those are the actual statements that you write in your code. The pre and the post condition are things that you know you write about because you assumedly think you know what the program is supposed to be doing. Um, so we need to access that, and the compiler already does that for us, and the compiler simplifies it, and it does a lot of the work like type checking and stuff. You know, if we had to do that on our own, it would be uh, pretty complicated. So um, as a compiler plugin, we need to be on the nightly build, uh, which has its own set of challenges. Uh, but we also get uh, kind of the nice feature that uh, whenever you make a change in your code and you try to recompile it, you end up running Rustproof again and formally verifying every time you make a change. So hopefully you can't break it without knowing it easily, unless you turn it off, of course. Uh, we also ended up using MIR, and if uh, you weren't familiar, uh, it's a, a, a mid-level intermediate representation that the compiler creates when it's compiling your code uh, to do certain optimizations and checks. Um, we found using MIR was actually very useful because MIR uh, is much simpler than user code. Uh, it's more, much simpler than uh, the high-level representation that uh, the compiler sets up before. Um, basically, when you get into MAR, everything is sort of like a big control flow graph. You have basic blocks. Uh, everything's an assignment statement. It's very simple. It's very easy to do the weakest precondition generation. Um, it makes everything easier. Uh, so hopefully MIR will continue to be useful uh, in the future. And so uh, we use an MAR pass. Uh, the compiler will call Rustproof when you decide to compile your code and you have our tag in there. Uh, the first thing we do is we'll look at the pre and post conditions the user puts in, we'll try to validate those. If those are valid they're in the right format, then we'll parse them and then we store them internally uh, using a uh, uh, parser gener uh, parser generator. Yeah, yeah, parser generator uh, called Lollipop. Uh, that's kind of well known. Um, then we start to actually looking at the user code and traversing MIR, which is in sort of a tree structure, and we start traversing those MIR blocks. Uh, we do a depth first search, go all the way to the endpoints, work our way back up, generating the weakest precondition as we go. There's different rules for different things you encounter in code, uh, but essentially it all gets lumped together in one really long Boolean expression uh, that can evaluate to true or false depending on the values you feed it. And uh, then we create a verification condition, as we mentioned before, by joining the weakest precondition and the precondition. Uh, then we use libsmt to take that verification condition and send it off to Z3, which is our SMT solver of choice. Uh, and we wait to hear back from it. And then eventually we'll report whatever those results are to the user. Hopefully, if it's invalid, we'll have a little uh, counterexample so you can you know, uh, hone down your bug hunting. Um, we had a few problems while we were designing it. It wasn't that bad, but uh, obviously dealing with Nightly and keeping that up to date was a little tricky at times um, because it can move very fast in some ways and be unexpected if we're not following the blog posts. Um, Eventually, we decided to set down with a specific version just because we were getting close to our deadline and didn't want to have to worry about uh, upgrading when we were trying to design things. Uh, and then uh, tests became kind of an issue. I mean, obviously, we wanted tests to make sure our program that's supposed to prove other programs was doing what it was supposed to. Uh, and we started off with some unit tests, but dealing with MIR became a bit of an issue. Uh, some of the objects we needed to handle around had complicated lifetimes and uh, were difficult to mock up. They're very complex tree structures. So uh, we mostly moved on to system testing, which uh, also became kind of an issue because as a compiler plugin, our program runs when someone else compiles their code. And to run tests in a nice automated suite through Cargo, you'd have Cargo call our program to call another program to call our program, and it got weird sometimes. Uh, <laughs> uh, we made it work, though. We have a pretty good suite that covers most everything now. Uh, as could be expected because it's a student project, we don't cover all the possible things we encounter in Rust code. In fact, we cover a very small subset of those. But uh, some of the basics, we have integer arithmetic, booleans, uh, 
half of assertions uh, and conditionals, you know, if else statements. Um, so as long as your code only has those things, Rust proof can try to prove things about it. Um, in the future, we're looking into loops and other stuff. The theory is pretty clear. We just have to look at how to actually implement it in a, a, a good way. Uh, we have a little demo right now. Let's see if that'll work. Uh, and this was originally made for a less technical audience, but um, should be fine. Oh. Let's take a look at some of the things that Rust proof can prove about our programs for us. We've defined a function called foo. It has one argument, which is a 64-bit unsigned integer, and it returns a 64-bit unsigned integer. This function takes one argument x and returns 10 divided by x. When using Rust proof, you supply pre and post conditions to a function like this. The precondition we've defined here is that x is equal to 5 and the post condition is that the return value is equal to 2. Now what this is saying in logic is that given the precondition that x equals 5, the return will be 2. So let's just take a look at how that would work and convince ourselves that that's true. In this function with an input of 5, 10 divided by 5 will yield a result of 2. So this should be true and match up with this function. Let's take a look at what RustProof tells us about this function and this attribute. So RustProof is telling us the condition is valid, and that's good. Let's take a look at what RustProof says if we mess up the condition and say that the return should be 3 instead of 2. RustProof here tells us that our verification condition is not valid. It also tells us under what condition the verification condition is not valid. This is telling us that when x is equal to 5, the verification condition does not hold. Because here we can see that with an input of 5, 10 divided by 5 is 2, and not 3 as we supplied in our post condition. So let's take a look at how we can change this function to prove it for all cases of input, and not just this specific case where x equals 5. So we're going to delete this restriction that x equals 5, and we're going to allow x to hold any value on the input. And for the post condition, we'll say that return is equal to 10 divided by our argument, x. Let's take a look at what RustProof has to say about this. So here RustProof is telling us that our verification condition is not valid. So that's a bad thing. That means there's some discrepancy between our code and our verification condition. Here RustProof is saying that when x is equal to 0, we have some error in our code. So let's take a look at what that could be. Here, 10 is being divided by our argument x. And since we know division by zero causes undefined behavior, we've identified something in this function that we might not have noticed before. So let's restrict x and see what RustProof says. We'll say that x is not equal to zero. And see what RustProof has to say about that. So RustProof says that our verification condition is valid. So here, we've proven that when x doesn't equal zero, for all other cases of input, this function is valid. And that's pretty cool. To write a unit test that tested all of these conditions, you would need a loop with 18 billion billion iterations. I hope that was edifying for some of you. <laughs> um, and then, uh, man, uh, whoa. I have no idea how to scroll on this. Okay. Uh, and then we just wanted to mention uh, that the uh, PSU capture, uh, Capstone program is always looking for sponsors. Uh, please check it out if you have, you know, idea for a cool project or you're part of an organization that might. I uh, wanted to thank our sponsors, uh, Jamie Sharp and Aaron Tome. And uh, if you have any questions. Mike, just speak into it with your question. Oh, okay. <laughs> what type of algorithms does RustProof utilize, and what's your speed? Can you meet, <clears throat> let me ask this, be very frank. Can RustProof, you're saying billions and billions? Because I'm working with an agency, a company, who can reach 100 teraflops in a second instructions, a process. Can RustProof? Uh, so during the process of building RustProof, uh, we had no limitations on uh, performance. Um, 
and in some cases, we can't have limitations on performance because the tool that we use, uh, Z3, uh, being what it is, it's trying to solve a, uh, it, it's trying to solve the halting problem, essentially. And there are some conditions where our code might never return from Z, Z3, or Z3, I, I suppose, specifically, will never return. Um, and this is true for, for all uh, SMT solvers. And uh, so, no, by, 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 by no means is our code at all efficient. Um, and it's, yeah. <laughs> you can repeat it. Is there anybody assigned to optimize it? Um, not currently, no. Nope. Um, it might be a thing that we do in the future because that would be that would be better um, because you know it, this being what it is, uh, our current compilation times uh, can sometimes measure in minutes, um, depending on how complicated how complicated the code can be. Um, so uh, it. Our, our project is definitely, it's, uh, it's a work in progress. It, need, it needs a, a lot, a lot of love. Um, so, yeah, uh, pull requests are absolutely welcome. Um, yeah. So, uh, Les, a question, more of a comment. If this project had preceded the flight controller project by like two years, it would have been greatly useful when we were writing our, our flight controller. Uh, it's definitely the kind of thing that we would have used if it was available. Rust is, of course, a new language, and things still need to be built for it. But uh, that, like operating systems, all of those things would be would be really, really useful to have. I have a comment about your earlier question. Um, the algorithm that we're using is basically that that weakest precondition generation stuff, and that that's really quick. We we just examine all the basic block structure that you have in your code, and since we're not dealing with loops or anything, we can't get caught in a loop trying to figure out what the invariant is or something like that. Um, so none of the actual slowness of the program is really related to our code. It's pretty much all on Z3 to return when it wants. Uh, uh, Pan Sophic Systems, uh, uh, Pan Valet. And uh, with Rust Proof, because it looks almost exactly like it from me sitting here, can would rust, <laughs> rust proof be able to handle? Uh, I mean, I, I guess you can port the the uh, uh, platform to rust proof or rust proof to their platform because it looks the only thing that that statement didn't have was a what? Well, you said it handles what if it didn't have what they call CCs, uh, the condition return CCs. Does you have that? It looks exactly like those. My background is extremely aviation and computers. And um, I did something that someone told me I couldn't do. They said, well, you can't, write, you can't write a parser and sort online. I did a bubble sort online, and I wrote an extreme parser using the hashing algorithm with a binary having also. And they kept everything down to a sub-second. And the guy was amazed at that. I said, no, that's, that's OK. If it amazed you, that's good as long as it works. But um, what I was focusing on, how easy would it be? Do you go the direction of porting Rust proof to other platforms? Other platforms to Rust proof. That's what Rust proof will run on any tier one Rust platform. Uh, basically, anything that supports nightlies will run Rust proof, as far as I know. Um, we haven't tested it on like ARM or anything, but it passes our compile tests. Um, so that's about it. Now we don't have any plans to port it outside of Rust or to any other platform that's not a tier one Rust platform. It's meant for meant for Rust programs running on platforms that support Rust. Okay. Um, any other high level questions for the group? And if you have more detailed questions about it afterwards, um, you're welcome to catch up with the team since we have until eight here. Yeah. I was just wondering if there's a way to establish a universal precondition for a function. By that I mean can guarantee that none of the other functions that call this function will ever pass in zero, for example? As far as I know, and so we haven't implemented actual function calls inside what we've done so far, so we haven't dealt with that. But the theory that I know behind it 
is that it's kind of based on the contracts surrounding the function that you're calling and the post condition of that function. Um, and that if you set it up all right, you don't need to worry about what's happening outside. You can just worry about your own contracts on your own functions. Hmm. Jamie, is that a thing? Okay. <laughs> so what would you do in that case with the function that divides by zero? If something was trying to hand it zero? Yeah. Well, you, I mean, you could put an assertion in, right, that zero is not allowed. You could. Right, but I don't want it to blow up at runtime. I want that. So just this notion that, um, you know, when, when we've got a statement um, and you're looking at the weakest precondition for that statement, uh, so you work backwards from what you were expecting the post condition to be to what the precondition should be. Um, the way you handle statements that are function calls is uh, you require that the post condition declared for the function you're calling has to imply the post condition um, that follows the call. And then the um, precondition, the weakest precondition for the function call is going to be um, the precondition for the function you're calling. It's actually a little more complicated than that, but, but you basically just copy the pre and post conditions from the function you're calling into the call site. Does that make sense? Well, can you annotate the You don't the have to. Site? So you've, you've annotated the function that you're calling. Right. Um, and then everywhere that it's called, when you're checking the functions that make those function calls, uh, you just reuse the annotations that were on the function they're calling. Mm. I'm not sure I follow, but I can it sounds like later. a conversation yeah. for later. Yeah. Okay. Any other um, high-level questions before we um, break for some hack time? <laughs> oh, let me let me get to the mic so we can catch your question for the recording. On the on the function calls. Can they be nested? And if so, how many levels deep can you go? And what's the limitation on nesting? I, I would think arbitrary. Yeah, Whatever uh, the there's, size because is. you're not actually evaluating the function calls. Um, there's not like any call stack or something where you could run out of memory. Um, it's it's uh, sort of flattening the the uh, the logic here. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much um, to the Rustproof Capstone Group.